My name is Paola Torres, Núñez del Prado. I come from Peru. Uh, I'm presenting two pieces that they are in progress right now. Uh, this first one is called Autorretrato or Self Portrait. Although sometimes I call it Sonic Portrait because what it actually does, uh, it would have in here, uh, it has a canvas painting. As you can see, the whole format uh, it's a direct reference to a painting. So let's say this is a frame of the painting, the canvas will be placed, turned up, you know, the other way around, turned up. But what it does is the complete opposite of a painting, in the sense that in the idea, in here is to touch, to, to, um, to actually uh, be really close to the piece. Without the presence of the person, it won't be complete. So uh, what the person will do is to touch the canvas, and this uh, starts, it will make, will start this process, which is basically, there is a web coming here, and with the touch there's a sensor. Uh, what it does is it reinterprets every pixel from the image, uh, giving it a certain value, interpreted again into sound. So uh, depending on the hue, the lightness and darkness, it would do like certain sounds, so you would end up listening to your own image. Again, uh, all of these, this series of works is very related to interpretation, which is a theme that I started pondering about almost eight years ago. It started with a small piece that I presented in New York, actually, as a performance action in Central Park. Uh, I did this kipu installation in the trees, tying up ropes. Since the system of the kipu had been lost, I decided to use the braille system. The braille system is the system used for blind people to read. So in, with the notes, I wrote vessel. At the time, I didn't really, I couldn't fully understand what I was doing. So this project is about trying to figure out what was what I was trying to do. Uh, eventually I realized that vessel was uh, very related to communication. Uh, a vessel is something that transports, but at the same time it can be taken as a path, in the case of blood vessels. So I like this duality. Uh, this made me think a lot of hermeneutics. I, um, I figured out, uh, I started thinking out the limit of our senses and how we perceive the world through them and how in turn we interpret it with our brains. Um, I, uh, I went under the say hermeneutical uh, idea that all interpretation, all translation is always an interpretation. In this sense there's some subjective uh, point of view always in every translation. So there's a change whenever we read uh, a book that was original written in Spanish, when we read it in English, and I'm sure if you are bilingual, you would notice this. There's sometimes a huge difference. And um, depending on the ability of the translator, this can make a complete different um, artwork or uh, and sometimes it's even there's information lost or there's um, artistic qualities lost in his translation if the translator doesn't know how to properly do it. So this in turn made me think a lot about this uh, sort of uh, the figure that we keep on seeing currently in uh, the art world, which is the curator, which may, in many cases is the one in charge of uh, a company to uh, say interpreting the pieces with a text. Uh, and nowadays people expect the curator to be the one to know what's going on. So uh, I, I made a correspondence with the translator and the curator. Uh, and I started thinking what could be, uh, what could the curator be given as an extra to the art world or to the artwork, and what could it be taken away as well? 
can it really know what the artist wanted to say? Uh, so this took me to think also about uh, black people and how black people interpret the world uh, differently to us. What uh, sort of things black people can perceive that we cannot. It's obvious what they cannot perceive, which is the visual world. But maybe they are more, uh, in many cases they have other senses more developed. So of course uh, the, your perception of the world is completely different. So, okay, These both pieces tend to uh, actually split people in two groups. So when you are actually listening to the image, you won't be able to understand it, but it's there. The information is just changed in another form. Um, but there is also a text written in Braille in the canvas. This information is specially uh, addressed to blind people. So blind people will actually be able to understand maybe more of the piece than people that are actually seeing it. Uh, the text actually explains what's going on around the person that cannot see. So uh, again, it plays with the limits of the senses. You can be blind, you can listen, but you won't be able to see again. You might be able to see, but you won't be able to understand what it's being written. So again, it, it discriminates, separates, which is what happens actually in reality in many and in society. Uh, again, these uh, pieces are, I think I, I've been thinking a lot, of, a lot about the social, uh, about society in general and how we work and how we, we interact among each other and, uh, and how our subjectivities can separate us or unite us. In this other piece, uh, which is a book, Mm, the text is from uh, Manuel Scorza, which is a Peruvian writer. Uh, the book is called, uh, of course it's not a whole book, it's an extract. It's called Redoble Porrancas, or translated drums for Rancas. And then you can see the first, uh, first change done by translation. It's not really, it's not the same word, Redoble and, and drums. It doesn't mean the same thing. So again, that was a change made by, it was the translator that decided that this would be better than the actual direct meaning translated. So this is the canvas. As you can see, this is the braille text supplied over the canvas. So when you touch this, the process will start. Uh, it actually, actually senses the place in which you are. So let's say the image, I mean, that's why it's called self-portrait. It's your face, the camera is in here, right? So it's your face, or uh, up till here, more or less. And it's actually uh, proportional to this area. So whenever you're touching, let's say, this part, uh, it will be, so if you're touching here, it will be this part that you're listening to. If you would be touching around here, it will be around your face and, and so on. So it's actually proportional to the, to the image that the, the camera is capturing. So the, the other one, the other piece that I'm presenting, uh, I call it the Book of Law, because really it, is, it started with me uh, reading a portion of um, Kafka's book, The Process. Um, and uh, there is this part in which the main character is confronted to the, the keeper of the doors of the law. And he is a poor man coming from the countryside and uh, keeps on asking this man if he can have access to the law. And uh, the man just basically threatens him. And he dies waiting. And he never got access to the law. So, uh, what did, why did I start to think about this? Because of course in every translation or interpretation process, there is, certain, there is a certain structure that you, can, that you need to keep also in, in every language, even in computer language. Even, I would say in computer language, the structure is way more rigid than in 
spoken or human language. So I was thinking about the relation uh, between these rules and actual law or laws, being it the physical world laws and human law. And how this and what happens when either the law is broken or when the law turns against uh, people. And this I will explain further. The text that I chose uh, for this book is uh, an extract from Manuel Scorza, a Peruvian writer. It's called Redoble por Rancas. In English, it has been translated to drums for Rancas, um, which is not the exact same word, redoble and drums. Uh, but again, this was the decision of the translator, so uh, you can see how it can change this subjective um, perception of the one doing the translation. So um, the text is written in Braille in this book, uh, and it's it's in Spanish. So if actually it's both of the texts are in, in Spanish. So if a blind person actually comes here and tries to understand it, it won't be able to understand it either. So there's like a double discrimination or like has been doubly uh, excluded. Um, so yes, uh, this book is about uh, the events that happened in the 60s in the highlands of Peru. Um, and it's related to mining and the damage that mining has done to basically all over Peru since the, con the, the conquer, since Spaniards came, uh, maybe even before. Um, as we all know, Peru is really rich in gold and many other types of metals, and this, I think it's, it's, the, it's a punishment <laughs> because uh, it's um, exposed, the land has been exposed to a lot of abuse from many people due to this fact. So again, this book is about the events that happened in a really small town called Rancas, in a, near Cerro de Pasco. Um, now, all of this sector, it's quite damaged by mining. There's this town, well, city nearby called La Oroya, if you look for pictures. It's destroyed, it looks like, after the world has ended. Uh, you know, like a, after the Third World War or something, the sky is gray, the, you know, nothing grows there. And um, this was the main center of a Cerro de Pasco Corporation, uh, a mining company that doesn't ex exist anymore. It was a US company. Uh, and it, um, so in this book, it's, it tells how the people try to um, go against it because uh, these were farmers and the mining, the mining processes and the mining explorations and uh, the, uh, the mining company had bought all of this land uh, so they wouldn't have any grass for their animals. They, couldn't, they were dying also because of the contamination. So they tried to go against it and it tells a story how basically they were all killed. I'm sorry if I'm giving away the ending of the, of the book, but well, yeah. So I tried to do a um, parallel in between what happened in the 60s and what is going on currently in many places in Peru, but I would say the most um, the most, the, the main one in, in this case I'm doing the parallel with is with the Conga project, which is also, um, which is like a big issue right now in Cajamarca, north of Peru. Uh, Cajamarca, it's been known since the time of the Incas to be a, a, a place where to get gold. So it has been exploited for centuries. And now it has, it's in the border of destruction. There's no, in the main city, there's no clean water anymore because Yanacocha Mining Company has taken control of the river. And it's not, um, and it's just actually giving to population the water uh, you know, filtered or clean after they've used it to uh, gold, pro, you know, the cleaning of the gold, separating from the 
gold to other, to other min minerals that it's attached to naturally. So um, I went there and, I, uh, and it was quite risky to get uh, images from there because it's highly controlled. They don't want you to, to record anything there. Uh, we, we had to, I, I went with some assistant, I couldn't really, we had to hide the cameras all the time because they, they speak up I was like, no, this is from the mining company. Okay, you have it. Uh, but we managed to get some recording. Well, I managed to get some recordings and uh, I, I recorded some sectors from the Yanacocha site and it's a nightmare, uh, cyanide, it's present, you cannot really breathe. Uh, and that's what they are planning to do in the Conga site. Conga is a group of, um, of lagoons in the highlands and the water from there, it's been, uh, it's the main source of water from all of the people farming in all, in 50% of Cajamarca sector or province. Uh, and they want to take control of this zone and exploit it because under this place, under these lagoons, there's gold. And they want to use the water also from the, la the lagoons to wash the gold and separate it for this process and then give it back to the population. And the population doesn't want this at all. So there has been already like five people dead out of protesting and uh, many, many people hurt. Uh, again, history is repeating. So uh, the images that this book will show when you touch the braille, the opposition, like opposite from this piece, when you touch the braille, images appear. And the images are uh, like, um, in one page you could see the, the traditional way of life from these farmers, and the other page the actual destruction from Yanacocha mining. Um, but again, this is not, it's not that clear. Uh, people will have to figure it out and maybe they won't fully understand what's going on, but the information is there. And again, all of these pieces are, are a bit like this. Information is there, but that doesn't mean that you will have the tools to, to access it fully.